Hi everyone, welcome to Electronics with Professor Magal. Uh, this is part three of lecture seminar series and today we have a very interesting speaker and his name is Dr. Patrick Martin. He is an autonomous engineer at Mitre Corporation. Those of you who don't know what Mitre Corporation is or what they do, they basically do research on behalf of different organizations and institutions such as Department of Energy, Department of Defense, or even Cybersecurity, and things like that. Uh, and the topic for today's talk is one of the hottest topic around. Yes, you guessed it right. It is on artificial intelligence and machine learning. The format, however, is a little different compared to the last two lecture seminars uh, we had. Uh, this is more of an open platform open discussion where students are going to ask questions to Patrick Martin and he is going to respond to it. So it's been done in a very informal and casual way and I hope you enjoy this talk because like I said this is one of the hot topics around these days artificial intelligence and machine learning. So without wasting much time let's get started folks. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Martin, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Can you guys see these ladies and gentlemen, these distinguished students of mine? I do, they look very distinguished. <laughs> okay, all right. So folks, we have Dr. Patrick Martin with us today uh, from MITRE Corporation, and he's going to give us a talk on the machine learning and artificial intelligence. And without wasting much time, I'll just give the floor to you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, did you all uh, watch the video? <laughs> yes. yes. All right, so uh, that was my lecture. Um, so what I really like to do is, is really gather from you um, what questions you might have about this technology um, or, you know, really anything like that, um, you know. And you know, don't be shy. So he's not just going to give a talk, he's just, this is going to be an open forum discussion sort of thing. Right? So feel free to just jump in and if you have any questions, ask, okay? So it's not like a regular speaker or like a, like a talk. Yeah. So I, I, I actually do have a, I thought of a few questions ahead of time. I'm not sure, you know, most of the actual technical aspects of how it works kind of flies over my head a little bit, but I had a few questions regarding, you know, your opinion on the future of AI and machine learning, if you if you can talk about that. Okay. So. All right, cool. I'll see what I can do. Uh, real quick, actually, are you all detecting any connection issues at all? No, it's a little it's a little laggy. But... Okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's what happened to me with with you all just a few minutes ago. Okay, that's fine. We'll figure it out. Technology, right? Um, Okay, so the future of AI ML. So that's that's a nice big big chunky question there. Um, uh, I'd say uh, we've got uh, a lot of challenges with AI ML because, um, for one thing, as you know, my AI lecture that I, I uh, gave to you all was very broad. It was about all the different subfields, and they've been around for fifty years. Uh, and so even after fifty years, we have all this awesome compute, and uh, we have you know, basically in our pockets now, we have supercomputers. Uh, we still have not solved artificial intelligence. So, so in my opinion, as far as the big picture of, you know, general AI, generalized AI, we are a long way from that uh, because uh, we as humans still don't even know what it means to be conscious or to be even, you know, just the fact that we are having this conversation now and you all understand me having another machine that basically would sit next to you and be something like kind of pretending to be a student learning new information, we are very, very, very far away from that. Um, and so that's sort of like the big picture of AI. Um, as far as machine learning, uh, there's a lot of hype about it. Um, have you all heard or seen any of like these IBM commercials on TV? Um, they make me cringe every time. <laughs> it's like, all these people talking about, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna AI this and AI that, and um, really what they're saying is machine learning. Uh, they're taking lots of data, 
And to me, we have a lot of, I think, as citizens, and you all are now, you know, in, e in an ECE program turning into engineers one day, uh, you should be cognizant of how machine learning and AI is sort of changing the way we do work. Um, a lot of, uh, because it's all data driven, we need to think more about privacy. You know, um, where is this data coming from? Um, do we have access to it? Uh, we have to be wary of, of things like that. So as concerned engineers and citizens, you all should be thinking about that with machine learning for sure. Um, I do think there's promise of kind of ragging on it right now. There, there are some good things about it. Um, for one thing, image classification uh, is big. And it actually works. I was in, I was doing my PhD when there, when right before machine learning just completely blew up. And um, I had some friends who were the kooky friends who loved partial differential equations and modeling imagery and everything and building these classifiers that were really hard to do. But once they did, they worked flawlessly. And then all their work basically gets shoved to the side because of machine learning. That now we can build these image classifiers really simply. Uh, I think that that's a good thing. You know, we're, we're, we're getting, we have some new capabilities, particularly in the field that I do, which is autonomous robotics. Having those modules available that have high accuracy rates is, is really good. Um, so uh, that was uh, that was my first attempt at answering your, your question. <laughs> but we can continue to drill deeper if you all come up with anything else. Well, that's, uh, that, that's, what, that, that's a great answer. Um, so you you just said you do autonomous uh, robotics, you know when you when you go into something like that you you pretty much have to bring up the the idea of self driving cars, right? You know that, that seems like a fairly good analog to that. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, I think MIT's Moral Machine. You know the the question of how should how should self driving cars handle those situations in which you know it's impossible to do everything exactly correctly. You know, how does, how does a machine like that, how should we train it to make decisions? So the moral machine, and I, I guess what you're referencing is that canonical um, problem of, okay, if I drive the Tesla this way, I'm gonna hit someone with a baby carriage, but if I drive this way, I'm gonna kill 12 pedestrians. Right. So. That kind of measure, I don't know how, we can't even as humans calculate that. So I don't know how we would endow a machine with that. Because in the end, like I said to you all uh, uh, in the lectures about machine learning, and in particular, well, I guess machine learning in particular, but AI in general, it's this notion of computational rationality. So you you have some kind of objective that you want to minimize or maximize. And so I don't know, in the end, we are the humans who design those objective functions. So maybe I wouldn't want to be that engineer that designs the objective function that favors the baby over the 12 pedestrians or vice versa. So I think that's more of a, that's something our society is going to have to figure out before the engineers do. Um, and, and so um, uh, I, I think that's, that's probably the, the only way we can go with that is, is having more engaged discussions that are very, um, that really, wipe away the magic that everyone claims that AIML has and really get down to brass tacks of what do we want to do as a society with this technology? I remember the video you were mentioning with, um, the bias that can influence AI. I just um, was wondering if you could speak further about that. Sure. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm turning up my speaker a little bit. So the question was, could I speak a little bit more about bias? And um, so uh, with, when you hear people talk about bias in AI, they really mean bias in machine learning. Uh, because machine learning, as I told you on the lecture, it's driven by statistics. Statistics is data that we capture as humans. It will always be biased. We can never get rid of the bias but we can design experiments that reduce bias. And so really what I think we have happening right now are lots of excited uh, engineers and computer scientists going, wow, look at this technology, this is fantastic. But they've never had like really rigorous statistics. They might've had it once in high school and went, oh, this is easy, I got this. But they actually need to talk to social scientists because social scientists are the ones who have to develop studies that sample from a population 
in an unbiased way. And I think the AI ML community is finally realizing they can't just do it all with the computer and go, hey, I'm smarter than you all because I majored in computer science and you're just a social scientist. Honestly, they know far more about how reduce how we reduce bias, and it's a front end problem. It's how do you get the data? Um, you can. Uh, you, there are people out there who claim that they can sort of like make things less biased later, and I find that research um, full of crap. So <laughs> there there are probably people who are tenured who are pitching that idea. In the end, it's data. You have to go to the front end of it. So that's what I was getting at with the bias in machine learning, is you need to absolutely understand how you, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve, and then go all the way to the front end and go, what, what are the data requirements? And then once I know the requirements, how do I make sure I'm sampling that data in a fair way? Um, without doing that, then yes, you will build a statistical model using machine learning that will be biased. And it will just be more biased than if you did a better job at the front end trying to change how you collect your data. Does that help? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. So I, had, I have another question. Um, so, you know, a big thing I know for the future is, you know, where a lot of people want AI to start making decisions you know, big, like big, large decisions based on data collects, right? You know, sort of fast track a lot of those processes. So when when you get to that level, how do you ensure that the decisions these machines are making are transparent? You know, there's going there's to be a lot of people who, if AI make decisions, say, you know, there was a case, uh, I think last year or something, where there was a lot of teachers uh, in some, some state getting fired based on uh, machine learning algorithms but nobody knew what the uh what the you know parameters were for those so you know do you think it's important that we have transparency and if so how do we achieve that in the long term yeah that that's crucial and and actually your example there i've not heard about that one that's that's pretty brutal there's uh other ones that have to do with sentencing so in the criminal justice system there's a model called the compass model, and it's a completely proprietary closed model, so no one knows anything about it, yet judges, depending on the jurisdiction, and they pay for this model, uh, they will use it to make recommendations on sentencing, and we have no idea where the data came from to build that model or anything. Um, and so uh, what I'd say we need to do more work on um, I guess going back to the bias question, we need to do a better job. Transparency starts with the data. And so you understand the data collect process, the, 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 the things we are collecting from, whether it is human entities, whether it's cars, um, you know, teacher uh, evaluations, whatever they may be, we have to make sure we understand that data set. Then we you build your model. So in the machine learning lecture that I told you all about, it's data first, and then you are fitting a model. So if it's like supervised learning, you, you have some tool, could be a neural network, could be a linear regressor. There's all kinds, there's dozens and dozens of tools. Um, you have to make sure that that model is something that we can interpret later, that we as a human could come back and query and go, okay, well, why was that decision made? Uh, if it's a neural network, you'll never get that answer really. The, uh, people who do research in neural networks just say, oh yeah, just look at all the parameters. There's only like, you know, five million. And I, 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 I can't, I can't, I've done it four. I've done it four parameters. If I don't know what your model's doing with four parameters, don't, don't bother. Um, but then we have this trade-off. It's like those neural networks really are awesome at certain things, um, but we don't really understand what's going on. It's, it's basically the data comes in, it plays pachinko through the neural network, and then out pops an answer. Um, and there's still a lot of research that has to be done to make better neural network models, but I don't think we'll ever achieve a point. There are researchers out there who are poking at this, but I think we're still a long way from understanding, you know, why does a neural network wire in a particular way with the data? Um, so then you might want to think more about, well, how do we build models that are simpler, that we understand Maybe they're not as accurate, but it becomes, we as the humans, because again, we know more than the machine, it's just a tool. And so we'd be building a simpler model that really would work with the human. So it might be you 
get something like a linear model that we understand, we can draw a line, we, we get that, but maybe its accuracy not, is not as high, but that's okay because it should just be sort of like a first pass. It might say, so in that teacher example, the, if it was a model that we had know nothing about and just said fire for these 50 teachers, someone will just say, oh, okay, it must be right. I don't know anything about it. Instead, you have something that maybe is not as accurate and then they're told, oh, by the way, this is a tool, but it's not super accurate. It's more of a flagging mechanism that you should follow up. That to me is a more effective application of machine learning and AI is it has to be with the human. Um, I don't see us, I, I actually do not look forward to the day when we just say, you know what, we're gonna throw these complex models into some system that just um, makes a decision for us and then we never go back and look at it. Um, so one, one kind of terrifying example is what China is doing right now with facial recognition. I don't know, have any of you all read about anything that they've done over there in China? Yeah. So basically every citizen in China is trapped. Their faces are trapped. Everything is tied to their bank account, their job, everything. And so if you like, just imagine this, you're on WPI's campus and you jaywalk, but you're, that you've been visually recognized and then later you get a ticket for jaywalking and they say, and, and also that's a strike against you. You'll get kicked out if you jaywalk two more times. That's effectively what's going on in China now with their citizens for everything. That if you do minor infractions to major infractions, everything counts against you to the point where you won't be able to get a job. Uh, and so that's some pretty terrifying stuff, especially since we are more of an open society and um, so, and we respect civil liberties. That's an example of also this type of stuff being taken too far, uh, as far as I'm concerned, where we believe in the data, we believe in the processes, the, the computers, and we don't really put the human back in the loop to question. Um, so I think that to me is, uh, is, as you all are going through engineering education, you will come across more and more AI and machine learning concepts. Um, keep that in the back of your mind that AI and ML are not the solution to everything. Uh, you should think about, well, wh where does the human fit in? And how do I design a future system? Whether you're on a team at Tesla building the next autonomous car, how does the human fit in? Um, th that needs to be explored. Um, you know, it should be front and center. So, uh, uh, you mentioned facial recognition. I know that, um, what do you call it, um, facial recognition is starting to be deployed by law enforcement for like detect detecting suspects. And I know that there's a discrepancy in accuracy um, in facial recognition, but depending on, um, what do you call it, your race, it's not as accurate. Right. Like it's most accurate for white males and it goes lower for white females to black males uh, and et cetera. So I'm just wondering like, what are the plans for addressing that? Are there any that you know of? So what you're referencing, I, I'm actually familiar, there's a great um, TED talk by this young researcher from MIT Media Lab who first uncovered that. All right, did you, did you see that TED talk? Yeah. I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fantastic talk where uh, it, so, so in the end, that comes back to the data and the bias questions. I believe, did you ask me about the, the bias question as well? Yeah. Your voice sounded familiar, but the, the, the camera wasn't turned over to you. Um, so it, it still goes back to where are we getting the data from? So in that case, whoever built that facial recognition model, um, they might have open sourced it, but they trained it off of a battery of images that were just easy for them to collect. Maybe they just grabbed all their friends down the hall and they all happen to be like 75% white male and 25% everyone else. So right then and there, that's a problem. That's a red flag as far as, well, if you're building some kind of model, what you've built is a model that is roughly 75% white male. And that's how those facial recognition things work. So the, the, the one that I mentioned in China is, is trained on the Chinese population. If you were to take that model or set of models or whatever, it's probably thousands of models that they've assembled over their giant infrastructure. If you were to deploy that directly in the United States, it would do terrible. It would not recognize anyone because there's different facial features and structure and skin tones and all these things. But that's because their data set is very different. So, so in the end, it, it goes back to what I was saying before with the social scientists, we need to think more like them and figure out how do we collect the data to solve the problem we want to solve. Not, hey, I heard about this new neural network, 
how do I hammer away with it? It's more of a think, think about the solution. Where do you want to be? And I think if we think more like that, uh, we'll, we'll uh, do a better job of reducing the amount of bias that slips in to these critical things. And, and personally, I don't know why we'd even be using such technology, but that's just me. <laughs> good question. These are all really good questions, by the way. So they did their homework, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> such a polarizing topic. It really mm. is. I, I have a question, Patrick. So sure. you, you did mention, uh, I was watching the videos, you did mention that uh, it's not that AI or ML just came out of nowhere. It was already out there for a very long time. It's just it has really evolved and applications have come out of it in recent times. And you do mention uh, that part of the reason it didn't come out in those years was because of the computing technology was a little far behind. But I was also thinking maybe at the, uh, in those times, maybe we didn't realize the potential of it, the potential of the technology as we realize today or the market it can capture. What are your thoughts oh, on that? Yeah, and I think those probably go hand in hand. I mean, in the end, it's, you know, but perhaps, no, I wasn't alive in, you know, 1953 when the first neural network was spawned, you know. <laughs> Or, or I'm doing a really good job, you know, drinking my soylent green and freezing my body, you know, every five days to stay alive. Um, but the, uh, so yes, I, I'd say they probably created these things and the scientists originally thought, oh, this is going to change the world. And they did. I mean, that's the thing is when you go back and you read old papers, they do talk about applications such as image recognition. They, I don't think they were talking about facial recognition, but they, they were trying to solve problems with like, very simple rudimentary robot arms grabbing blocks and just moving them around. Um, that was in the 60s when they were doing some of this image recognition stuff. Um, so they were just excited enough that they had math and some very simple computing that could exercise a prototype. Um, and I'm sure some of them thought, oh, this would be a great thing to have, but uh, part of those AI winters when things would crash that was typically when people were bringing things to market, trying to get it up the cliff, and then they realized this is not going to scale, and then everything tumbles down. Um, so I, I think that is coupled with the technology, like the computing technology as well. They, they go hand in hand. Um, I mean, I just think about the Internet itself. Um, you know, when I first, when I was in high school, um, I, was, I was using dial still. I had an... I mean, my parents didn't cancel their AOL.com dial-up account until like eight years ago. And I went, okay, it's dead, everybody. Okay, let's move on. Um, but, but with that, you know, dial-up, I didn't think I would ever, you know, hook up one of my video games over dial-up and be playing with friends. And within three years or four years, the first Xbox came out, and I was fragging people in Halo on my local area network at college. So... Um, <laughs> there, that was computing, that was networking, and, and also people creative enough to utilize those resources. So it's all going to go hand in hand. Thank you. Sure. I've got another question. So uh, you, you mentioned before that you think, you know, AI and machine learning should be used largely to make, you know, suggestions on actions that humans should take. You know, you, you said you dread the day where, you know, the machines have to make the decisions. Um, and that's, that's very good, but what happens when we get to the point, you know, where machine learning and AI is used on the other side of things, on the, on the malicious side of things, to create these, like, you know, I'm sure you've seen the media reports of the AI creating these incredibly realistic fake videos and pictures yeah. that's completely, yeah. you know, undiscernible to the human eye. So what happens when one of our good AIs flags one of those and sends it for manual review and the human eye can't discern a difference in that? That, I have no idea. <laughs> That's a hard problem. Uh, but it does highlight the fact, I mean, so, so, so also keep in mind, uh, it's like all this image recognition software, in order to build the data sets, there has to be a human there 
drawing a bounding box around my face and saying, Patrick. I mean, that's basically when you, I don't know how many of you have used like um, Apple Photos on their laptop or desktop or something. So I noticed the other day, uh, it actually queries me to like label my own kids and my wife like, and fam, my in-laws. And it gets really confused with the babies in the family. It'll like take one baby and say, oh, this is your, this is Samantha, right? I'm like, no, no, that's my son, that's Andrew. But it's because it's facial features, but I'm the labeler. I'm actually sitting there going, oh no, that's this kid. Um, I could feel like, I could just change it and say, actually, no, I'm gonna really make my life miserable and change it to be one of the other kids, and then it propagates through the entire data set. Um, so we, so with that example you were describing, basically the, the, the machine learning, basically thing was like a neural network backwards, you know, the machine learning, um, uh, the neural network that we're saying, okay, generate this frame of a fake video with these parameters. So I send in the parameters on one side, the fake video frame comes out on the other end. That is based off of data that we have labeled and created in some sense. And so then to say, now we have this other AI that's looking at that, trying to detect a fake, well, we better have a data set of fake things. And to me, it's going to be this ratcheting up arms race of, you know, and, and this is happening. It's, it's also like, I'd say it's very similar to cybersecurity. Uh, the cybersecurity world, they'll deploy a solution and it's bypassed in like a day. And they have to keep ratcheting it up. I think, unfortunately, we're going to be in the same case with AI. And, uh, well, I guess I'm saying AI. Machine learning, <laughs> these neural networks that are pumping out these, this data, new data, we will just have to be vigilant. And, uh, and, and that's where it's going to come down to. I think there's, um, there is a DARPA program that launched recently that is studying that very challenge you're talking about. Uh, and so there's people talking about somehow embedding uh, cryptographic signatures inside of neural nets and stuff like that. Um, but I don't do any work in that directly. But uh, I think what you've posited is a very hard problem. And we are going to have to face that in our society for sure. But I don't have a solution to it. If I did, I'd, I wouldn't be talking to you all. I'd be like on a boat somewhere. <laughs> on a yacht. I would have sold my company last week. I'm, like, I'm not talking to these kids next week. <laughs> That's fair. I have a question. Now that you mentioned cybersecurity, um, I'm just wondering about like the implications of machine learning when it comes to cybersecurity. Because I'm just imagining like, um, if an AI were to present like a cybersecurity threat, like an AI whose entire purpose is to break into a system as compared to like humans trying to break in, how dangerous would that be and how would somebody prevent that? So that kind of like what, what was described there uh, by your colleague in the room, it's, it's kind of like the, the image, the fake imagery stuff is you've got, an, you've got a bad actor. And, and believe it or not, these things are already live. So there are, one could argue, AI-enabled systems. There are, and they don't have to be machine learning enabled. They could be, uh, like in the other, they could just be using planning algorithms. Like I mentioned, that's one subfield of AI. It doesn't have to be machine learning. It could be just doing optimization, trying to poke and prod on ports of a, of a you know, computer's, uh, computer's open ports, trying to figure out which is the, the open one. That right there is still another game of cat and mouse where uh, there will be one of these adversarial AIs attacking our system. And there are people doing research to some, some success. There are actually some people at MITRE working on this, but I'm also aware, you know, there's a much broader community in cybersecurity that I'm not a part of that is looking at defensive tools that are machine learning based. But again, the challenge is the data. So if you're gonna take a machine learning approach, you actually are gonna have to have threat data that you know is really a threat. It's labeled as, this was a bad attack. But those are such, they're so few and far between, they're rare events that we actually detect them, that your machine learning based classifier um, may not capture them. Uh, so that's going to remain a challenge. So you're probably hearing from me uh, kind of a broken record about, it's all about the data uh, for, for these machine learning tools. We rise up into the other techniques in AI, like planning, probabilistic reasoning. Uh, then you get you can probably mix and match and create new solutions. But at the end of the day, there's still going to be data under the hood that we need in order to know that yes, we are under a cyber attack. That is not just someone um, opening up uh, uh, some random website with cat videos.
how many like countermeasures <laughs> are there to like malicious AI and machine learning? Like I know there's like captchas, which I'm sure everyone here has used before, but are there any other things like in the works? Like um are Oh, I lost your audio. Could you could you restate that? I lost your audio for a moment. Yeah. Um, what kind of like countermeasures are there against malicious AIs? Because I know like captchas, which everyone here has used, but um, are there any other things like in the works or? That I don't know. Um, th th there is certainly. Well, I don't know in detail. I know there are some DoD efforts to try and and. Um, uh, basically create techniques for stopping these adversarial AI-based systems. Um, but I don't have a concrete example for you. Um, but I will say, whenever you do a CAPTCHA, uh, you're actually helping a machine learning algorithm. <laughs> They're feeding you something that the computer has not recognized, and they want you, the human, to label it for them. So have you ever gotten those ones from Google that's like a grid of nine squares and says, mark all the palm trees, mark all the cars? Yeah, you are a part of their labeling system, so you should get a few cents every time you do that as one of their labelers. <laughs> or we should get it wrong multiple times in a row to throw them off. Right, I do that, I do that for fun sometimes, just because I'm like that. But <laughs> no, I'm willing to suffer like three invalid login attempts just to maybe add a little noise to their classifier that they're going to try and make money off of. <laughs> So the, there are, uh, you know, on, on, this, on the subject of like CAPTCHAs and all those countermeasures, I know there are, you know, some, like for example, some AIs or, you know, machine or like neural networks right now that say have Twitter accounts. Do you know how they got past the I'm not a robot? No, I don't. Uh, my guess is there was a human that set up the account. Uh, some, uh, someone from an uh, Eastern European country that set up an account. I don't know why they would do such a thing. Uh, a fake account that's just going to blast a bunch of nonsense. More likely it is an ad a very smart adversary who is just opening the door to insert the bot and then they walk away. Um, that's that's really the only way to overcome some of that stuff. But who knows? Uh, they're, they're, uh, th there might be someone out there who's aggravated like me with all those Google CAPTCHA things and now they've automated that too. So. How do I throw off robocallers? <laughs> Again, if I knew that, I wouldn't be talking to you all. I'd be like basking in the sun in Mexico or something. I can see yeah, all the questions are different. I don't know, they bother me all the time too. I just I just hit the stop button or whatever. I silence them. Yeah, actually on that topic, that is an interesting question. You know, all those robocallers, I, I can't imagine, you know that actual people are deciding where those calls go. How do, you know, those centers, like how do they determine who those calls go out to? You know, I got, I got a call the other day from a Chinese consulate in Washington, DC, and I've been to DC <laughs> once and I don't speak a word of Chinese. So what algorithm decided, hey, this guy in Massachusetts, you know, really needs to get this Chinese phone call. I've gotten that same phone call. Yeah. Like, we're like we're like robocall brothers. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. Um, so, so I'm gonna guess a lot of these uh, these people. Again, I don't work in that field, but just I think about the data. So, like being an engineer who knows this 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 technology, I sort of go back to where do you think they're gonna get their data sources? And uh, there are public records out there, and probably your your cell phone, maybe you used your cell phone while you were in DC. And somewhere, perhaps in Verizon Log or somewhere, you know, whatever network your phone actually attached to when you were down in DC, there may be a public record or more deviously, there's a not so public record, more of a private corporation record like Verizon or Sprint might have, then they got hacked. And then they're using that, they're harvesting the data and if anything, the robocallers are probably just looking at proximity to wherever they want to target. And they're just randomly sampling from the list. It may not even be a machine learning thing. It's just writing clever software. Uh, but I would say that's you're getting more into like cybersecurity risks of some of these companies that log all of this data about us, giga, gigabytes upon gigabytes of data. All it takes is one adversary to get in there, and then they've got you know a whole ton of data on us. 
uh, to create robocalls, and that's probably what happened. I mean, heck, all the robocalls could have started because, um, let's see, how long goes it now? Three, four years ago when uh, the government um, OPM, the Office of Personal Management, was hacked by the Chinese, and 40 million people's, including mine, <laughs> are actual applications for our security clearances, which carry everything. Social security of yourself, your spouse, your parents, uh, everybody was all harvested. So all of that then gets sold into the black market, in basically information black markets and stuff. So yeah, there's lots of probably data out there that these systems can use. This, I hope this is really cheering you all up on a yeah. Wednesday. Like, I love technology, man. This, this is, is great. great. Sign me up. I want to be an ECE major. <laughs> That's what the goal is, Pat, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, well, I guess we should learn about machine learning then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should be. Yeah. Maybe Most not. of them are. Maybe not for long. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you see the future, like uh, how long before we see autonomous vehicles on the streets and the roads and how is the government ready for it or are they supporting of these efforts? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, So we're struggling. So, you know, I've supported some parts of the government that are thinking about how do we regulate autonomous vehicles and because we live in this weird confluence of Autonomous vehicles are still in the research lab, and yet we have all these companies just dumping billions to try and be the first to market. Um, I do not think, in, in the United States specifically, because, again, we are more of an open society. We have feder we, our, our own system of government is federated. You know, we have, uh, going from the local communities, you know, um, including, you know, the universities like WPI to, the, to the, uh, the, the townships and the cities that these places live in. Then that rolls up to the state, which then rolls up to the federal level. Um, we are, there's less top down control and that's going to make it harder for us to adopt autonomous vehicles. Um, so we're going to see it piecemeal for sure. Um, I know I have a student who um, is working for, uh, let's see, what's the company? He's a, it's a former student of mine who, uh, he's working for Optimus Ride in Boston. And what they are developing, they're, they're saying, you know what, uh, an autonomous car like from Uber or Tesla, that's science fiction. We're over a decade away, which I would agree with. Like we're far longer away than people think with those. They're focusing on something smaller, autonomous shuttling. Basically, if you have a district, you know, maybe a planned community or a campus, let's say, like WPI, and you have autonomous golf carts, let's say, um, that is a more controlled environment. I think we'll see those sooner than we'll see, you know, a, a, an actual no one in the car Tesla driving around our cities. I would be very afraid of those because we don't have the regulations in place. We don't even know how to certify them. Um, so, so I think. We still have a ways away from that. There will be, I think, some insertions of autonomous vehicle technology we will see in um, a little more closed environments, for sure. Uh, so I think that's within five years. We'll see more of that, for sure. Um, I know down here in Virginia, we just had, uh, and actually New York, um, we, there, there's some places that have approved with the FAA, uh, basically uh, highways for drones, for air drones. So, um, so I know in uh, New York, there's about a 50 mile stretch where there is clear airspace where your drone, they could set up like a UPS shipping of, you know, stuff via drone. Um, so we're going to see other examples like that. Uh, but I think uh, why um, I'm trying to think there was a Super Bowl ad that was hilarious not too long ago. Um, it was an Audi ad. It was this Audi ad where all these people are running around because there's drones flying everywhere. Does anyone remember this ad? I do. Yeah. It's like four years old, and they're like crashing into everything and chasing people down. And some guy, of course, gets into his Audi and like drives away. And um, but that notion of just total chaos of drones, I think we're not going to have that. The the, the regulators are at least getting their handle on what needs to be done with that, um, at least in the legal sense. I think there will still be illegal uses of drones that we'll have trouble with, um, but. You know, that's that's partly that's what the DOD and Department of Homeland Security have to solve. Nice. 
one more person? Doesn't even have to be an AI question. <laughs> Give me anything. I used to teach ECE. I love ECE. What are you all type? What, what classes are you in? This one. <laughs> no. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> the one right now. Just, just that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. These are uh, mostly freshmen. Yeah. So they're taking electrical and computer engineering uh, freshman level courses. Okay. Yeah, very basic. Yeah. Well, well good. Well, we need more machine learning skeptics. So that's what I hope I've turned you all into. Yeah. Yeah. So, good. Good. so you can understand there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. And I hope that will uh, help you as you all move through your, your career here. Um, is there anything else, Patrick, you'd like to share before we wrap this up? <clears throat> Folks, any question? Oh. One last chance. No. Oh, Wait, um, Wader has one more question, Patrick, actually. Have you oh, you got another question? Of yeah. Taybot by any chance? Oh my god. <laughs> Taybot by any chance? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Have you heard of Taybot by any chance? No, I haven't. Oh. Oh, oh wait, the yeah. Tay, the, like the actual, the, the Twitter, yeah. Taybot? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. I was, see, in my head I'm thinking of like an actual robot running around on the ground. <laughs> this shows you where my brain is. So yes, Tay is terrifying, but also completely expected. How do we know about the Taybot? Like, if we sort of like unleash an AI on the internet, how do we prevent it from becoming a Taybot? I, I think there has to so so Tay was basically an unfettered machine learning system. Uh, we are going to need to build. Really, it becomes a, an engineering problem. We need to take you know there was some algorithm at the core of Tay that's doing natural language processing and learning patterns from the interactions with users. We need some other kind of engineering that wraps around it that effectively is the. Uh, we need to cut this thing off filter, you know, or or things that reject certain types of interactions. I think that's where it's going to be. I, I was just at, um, so here at Minor last week, we had this thing called a, a we call them a technical exchange meeting, where a bunch of uh, people from government and Minor get together, and we were talking about how do we do AI right? And to me, and many others here at Minor, we consider it really a systems engineering problem. It's the algorithm, the machine learning or the AI algorithm that you deploy is just one piece of your engineered solution. So you need to make sure that the rest of the solution keeps that in check or you know keeps it on its narrow focus. Um, and then you will prevent things like Tay. So Tay, I think that was just Microsoft Research trolling the world and they did a wonderful job. <laughs> <laughs> I think they underestimated how fast on Twitter would feed Tay so much bad data. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's a lesson about life. That's that's why I I had to kill Twitter and Facebook and everything like three years ago. It was like, no, nah, I can't I can't handle the internet anymore. Uh, that's, that's a really good question. How do you how do you handle bad data? You know, like do you just blow up the model and start it fresh, or is there a way to like you know, if a model's founded on bad data, is there a way to correct it? No. No, you would, you would want, if you know that that data is fundamentally flawed for the problem you're trying to solve, then the model will be flawed and you have to trash it. And what you do is you instead go back to your data and clean it, whatever your metric for cleanliness is, whether it's, you know, you have more values that are, you know, the, that are sampled correctly, you, you've uh, accounted for bias in what you're trying to do. But yes, in that case, if I was handed a model and I knew the data was bad, I would just say, forget the model, give me the data. And then also go find me the engineers and, and scientists who collected this data so I can smack them. <laughs> <laughs> How do you determine what is and isn't bad data when you're dealing with like terabytes of data? How do you shift through that? So that, that's what a data scientist does. That's not what I do. <laughs> 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 that, that is that is someone who really loves statistics to the point that they just want to sit at a computer and and write little scripts that that charge through and do statistical measures. Um, 
but it is. It's 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 all stats, and basically you're just gonna. I mean, if you like that, that's your bag. Um, Google and Facebook will pay you a lot of money to do that. So I just don't want to do that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this was awesome, Patrick. Any other question, folks? Right. Well, let's thank uh, Dr. Patrick Martin. Well, thank you. Thank you again for your time. This was lovely. This was awesome. Better than I was okay, expecting. Great. Actually, I was worried about the technology part of it, but I think we managed it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, next time we'll put Tabot on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. I'll close Good the window. Good luck with your studies, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.